and welcome to the SharePoint Framework and JavaScript Special Interest Group Biweekly Sync. It is April 22nd, 2021. I'm your host, Patrick Rogers, on this call. And as always, we have a great agenda for you today. We'll have latest updates around the SharePoint Framework, patterns and practices program updates, new community samples details, picture time and together mode. And we've got three great demos again from Albert, Mike, and some guy named Vesa talking about SharePoint Framework. So very excited to get those demos out to you. But first, details around opportunities to participate. So we always encourage folks to demo on all of our community calls. If you'd like to demo, please do reach out to myself or Vesa. We'd love to get you scheduled on the call. I think it's one of the best parts of these calls to see all the amazing work you are doing for your uh, customers or the companies you work for. So please reach out to us. That can be uh, for this call, anything around client-side development or the PMP offerings, uh, please do uh, reach out. Or uh, you know, if you've got other SPFX demos, stuff like that, love to see it. And if you've got ideas for other kinds of demos, reach out anyway. We could find the right community call for you to do that demo on. Love, love, love to have you contribute those demos. As well, you can contribute on GitHub through reporting issues, submitting pull requests, or helping with issues and questions. That's a great way to contribute, is if you happen to see somebody else with a question and you happen to know the answer to, please do go ahead and answer that. It really helps everybody out and gets people answers uh, faster. And then, as always, we welcome your feedback on everything we do in PNP. So how are these calls? How is our documentation? Where else can we help? And of course, positive feedback is okay too. If we're doing something you like, perhaps we can do a little bit more of it. So please let us know. And then moving into our giant page O links, uh, the main link to remember there is aka.msm365pnp. That will take you to the Patterns and Practices landing page, which will link you out to all of these other resources. So we have developer videos, which are topic-focused videos on things like authentication, Teams app development, using the Microsoft Graph Toolkit, and other uh, great features there. We've got our community videos, which are the recordings of all of our calls, such as this one, the monthly calls, and other uh, calls we uh, might do throughout the month are all recorded and posted there. I think in four or five years, we've only missed one or two recordings, which is kind of amazing. And then we've got a ton of great open source uh, uh, organizations that are active and accepting uh, your participation. Uh, so the SharePoint, PNP, Office Dev, and Microsoft Graph Orgs are all uh, open and uh, want you to join in and help out uh, or participate in how uh, you would like. So please check those out. And then we've got tons of samples in a, across many galleries. So we've got Teams, SPFX, Power Platform, uh, SPFX extensions and list formatting samples all available. So certainly check those out. And all of that can be found under aka.ms slash m365pnp. Next up is uh, David with Sharing is Caring. Thanks, Patrick. Well, within our open source and inclusive community of Microsoft 365, we have a wide array of tools and resources for everyone to take advantage of. In fact, you can contribute back to those tools and resources as well, but we understand that sometimes there's some hurdles uh, in contributing back and, in fact, even using those resources. So Sharing is Caring is here to provide hands-on guidance sessions which walk you through how to take advantage of these opportunities, whether it be your first time contribution by updating the development documentation or the Microsoft documentation, all of which you're empowered to do, creating new documentation, setting up your workstation, a wide array of opportunities to learn how to get more involved. And these are safe space opportunities to ask any and all questions. We don't record them. Great opportunities to collaborate with others in the community as well. So we invite you to join any of the sessions. They're all free. As I mentioned, not recorded. In fact, we have a session later today on Community Docs, if you would like to learn more about that. And we have a special edition AMA coming up in the next couple of weeks on the brand new Power Platform Samples Gallery. So aka.ms forward slash sharing is caring. Register for any and all sessions. We'd love to see you and we hope to work with you soon. Patrick, back to you. Thank you, David, for that update, and love to continue to see the growth uh, in this Sharing is Caring initiative. It's really fantastic seeing so many first-time contributors come out of that. It's a great, great, great resource. Uh, if folks are interested in getting started, as David said, please join one of these sessions. It's a great way to learn, great way to meet some folks, and great way to get involved. So aka.ms sharing is caring. And we have a new Microsoft 365 Extensibility Lookbook Gallery. So this is a great way to look at how to customize various Microsoft technologies or surfaces, such as Teams, SharePoint, OneDrive, Office, 
the Power Platform, uh, all great ideas on how to, uh, you know, patterns to follow as how you build out your extensibilities. And uh, there's a lot of different uh, ideas there to help you figure out in your solutions. Uh, you could pick and choose different pieces of these, but great resource here. Check this out, ak.ms M365 Extensibility, another fantastic community-driven resource. So thank you to everybody that's helped uh, contribute and build that. And uh, love to see that continue to grow. As well, we have a new uh, developer community survey, which is now open. So help us by answering uh, these questions. So these uh, questions help us craft what we're going to do for the next uh, year. So Microsoft is deep into planning, which means uh, we're deep into the PNP planning. So think about responding to this survey is probably a better way to say that. And uh, let us know your thoughts. Uh, this is a great way to give us some feedback. And uh, every piece of feedback will be reviewed and read, and and uh, we value it. And if you've got stuff you would like to share that doesn't maybe fit in the survey or you're not comfortable putting into the survey, uh, feel free to reach out to someone directly. Uh, again, as, as mentioned earlier, we always are interested in your feedback and your thoughts. So uh, please uh, do share your thoughts and take the time to complete this survey, ak.ms slash M365 PMP slash survey. And I just learned you can add an extra slash to your aka.ms link. So that's very cool. And with that, we'll go to SharePoint framework updates with VESA. Yeah, we're going to be pretty fast on these slides. So just a uh, update since last time we had this uh, bi-weekly call. Uh, so we did uh, announce last week uh, a public preview of SharePoint Framework 1.12.1, which is basic for testing the upcoming features. Uh, we're going to focus more on what's coming in the later part of the call as well. But this is available uh, if you want to help us on, on validating the upcoming feature. And we're going to do this for the all of the future releases as well, and with 113, 114, and all of that, you can install the latest version by using the at next uh, in npn install g at Microsoft generated dash SharePoint at next is always the, the previous stuff, and then the at latest is always the currently in production uh, uh, stuff. So you can actually differentiate what are you installing. Uh, just a quick recap on this one. We're going to focus more on these items uh, in the later part of the call. Nothing new major in here. Um, I'll deep dive on the plant schedules and all of the individual things in this list in the last demo of today. So I'm not going to take more time off on this in here. Uh, we're planning to release SharePoint Framework 1.12.1 uh, in upcoming days. Uh, I'll, I'll tease in some additional things in the last demo, but let's get back to you, Patrick. Thank you, Vesa. Very excited to see those betas go out. Please uh, take the opportunity to try those out and provide feedback to the team. Those betas are a really valuable asset in you getting to test new stuff in your applications, as well as getting us feedback on how we can be better uh, uh, prepare those for the actual eventual release. So fantastic new development to have those betas available. And with that, I will stop talking and pass it to Julie for client side library updates with PMPJS. Hey, so uh, thank you, Patrick. So we just released the 2.4.0 release on April 9th. Um, there was lots and lots of doc fixes and a bunch of unit test fixes. We still do have a little bit of unit test fixing and love to do. Uh, there was a fix for the add chunk file names uh, with uh, file names with apostrophes was fixed. Uh, we also added a, gra a new graph endpoint for user presence. So that those endpoints are there now. So definitely keep your feedback coming. We have closed uh, feedback for version three planning. So there is still that issue. So you can go read up on all the details, but we have sort of moved forward with our plans and our, our deep in uh, V3 working sessions. Um, so you can go review that 16.36 issue if you want to see what's uh, what's happening. Um, certainly you can comment and, and we'd love to hear any feedback you have. But our plans have been sort of set at this point. And also, I just wanted to give everyone a heads up, especially those following the repo, that we added a new GitHub action that locks old closed issues. So um, that's because uh, we do not review or check up on any uh, comments made on closed issues, and we wanted to make sure that was a better user experience for everybody. So the, uh, the proper way to start an issue on something that's related to a closed issue is to start a new issue, and then you can reference the closed one with any of your additional details, trying uh, obviously your best to fill out those forms in as much detail as possible so that we can get a head start on helping you with whatever your situation is. Also, don't forget to follow us on Twitter, M365PMPJS. 
And uh, that's all I have. Back to you, Patrick. Thank you much, Julie. Great update there. And I'll just say uh, for folks uh, following along at home, there is now a version three branch in the PMPJS uh, repo. Uh, feel free to check that out. It is 100% not usable production ready code at all at this point. But uh, if you're interested in seeing what we're up to, it's there and we will be posting issues and things soon uh, for folks to help out. And now CLI updates for Microsoft 365. So new beta 3.9 is out with upgrading SPFX projects to the new uh, 1121 release, uh, creating Azure AD apps from a manifest, creating Viva Connections desktop app packages. That's a great new addition. And then uh, adding site app permissions and more. Lots of great sample scripts uh, as well now available. You can always install the beta from npm, npm install dash g at pmp slash CLI dash Microsoft 365 at Next. It's a fantastic tool uh, for cross-platform uh, project uh, management or application management, as well as a lot of lifecycle work, as well as interacting with uh, Azure Graph and SharePoint directly as well, right from the CLI. Uh, really great, valuable tool. Uh, if you haven't used it, it really is a great thing to have in your back pocket if you need to do some quick actions, some quick, quick scripting, uh, cross-platform, uh, really neat to see that and uh, continue to grow. I mean, it's really a fantastic uh, uh, place where people have just been uh, contributing and developing and joining in and helping out. So uh, fantastic to get see that continued growth uh, over time for the CLI. Next up, the SPFX reusable components. We've got uh, two sets of controls. The React controls are designed uh, to work in the body of your web parts and application customizers. 2.6.0, latest version there, with some uh, new updates for animated dialogue, icon picker, list item picker, and some various fixes. The React controls 3.0 are on hold. So that is waiting for the actual release of 1.12.1, as there's going to be uh, some breaking changes required to support the new SPFX release. So that'll be a 3 o release, uh, but that is on hold for now. And then there's the other set of controls. The property controls are designed to be used in the edit pane of your web parts. And those uh, have two new things, uh, property field editable combo box and the column picker, uh, two super new controls in there. Uh, and as well, the 3.0 version of the property controls are on hold for the same reasons as the other controls. We're waiting for that uh, 1.12.1 uh, actual release there. So if you haven't checked these out, it's a great way to jumpstart your project and get your development underway early and uh, save yourself a lot of development time with these ready to drop in controls. Next up is modern search. So ak.mspnp-search. So this is a great set of flexible web parts that you can compose together to create a modern search portal. It's responsive and it uses uh, SPFX and you can configure things to work just how you want to work. So there is a 319 release uh, in April and that has uh, some fixes in it. The uh, my understanding is the three branch is uh, sort of in maintenance mode at this point with uh, more work focused now on the 4.x uh, branch. So 4.1 released March 20th uh, with uh, no need to deploy to the tenant app catalog and Danish translation support, uh, which is awesome to see localization uh, happening for these controls. I think that's really valuable uh, and something uh, it's great to see the community building that in there uh, for the 4.1 uh, release. So excited to see that. If you haven't checked out the modern search solution, pmp-search, aka.mspmp-search for all the details around how to use that, set that up and get things working. Next up is SPFX samples with Hugo. Awesome. Are you looking for web part extensions code samples for the SharePoint framework? Well, we've got hundreds and hundreds of curated samples for web parts and extensions in our repositories, and they're there to help you get started or maybe to just help you solve a development pattern and deliver your solutions faster. So these updates are for the last two weeks on the SPFX extension side, so aka.ms slash SPFX extension, we have a new new sticker extension by Ari Gunawan, and uh, the extension allows you to display news as a running text at the top of every modern page. On the SPFX web parts side, so that's aka.ms slash SPFX web parts, 
Chandani Prajapati has updated the data table to actually add the user display or the people display in the people columns and also updated the PDF and CSV export to actually include the person's name on an export. Uh, Tristian O'Brien has added uh, the about me and skills to the staff directory web part and Andre has created a new OneDrive finder, which allows you to actually uh, access your OneDrive from, uh, from a web part, and then you can actually navigate through, and it's actually a new uh, file list control, which you definitely should look at. We also have a new update or new web part by Sebastien Avaire, uh, the Graph MGT client, which actually uses the Microsoft Graph Toolkit to uh, to allow you to create graph queries in the web part, and you can actually see the results. And then finally, we have a Teams membership updater by Nick Brown, which allows you to update membership of a team based on a the content of a CSV file. So it's really useful if you have to do a lot of uh, migrations, a lot of moving people around, and that's also available as well. I just wanted to thank everyone for all your awesome sample. We have just uh, recently hit over 120,000 uh, visitors in, in March uh, when we had uh, about 90,000 uh, in February. So we're definitely, the word is getting around, people are starting to use the samples and we're definitely looking for more samples. Thank you everyone for being awesome. Back to you, Patrick. Great stuff, Hugo. Thank you for that. And really, just the the samples are another incredible resource for the community. There's so much good content in here, so many great things to learn. Uh, I check this out when I have new projects or or research I'm doing to see how folks have solved problems. Uh, really outstanding uh, work by everyone involved, and I really uh, want to appreciate Hugo as well for helping to really drive uh, the quality of these samples and getting everything up to date. So great work. By everybody. And now we're on to optional picture time where Vesa steals the presentation away from me and yep. presents his screen showing uh, some form of the together mode. Today we're doing the jungle scene. Yes. It's this a is jungle one of those uh, I've never entirely understood the, where this came from. <laughs> Oh, you mean why it's a jungle? Yeah, I like no why? The... <laughs> well, I, I think we're hitting. We'll uh, still a few more. We have just the, about just the 50 people. In, it's in. like an outdoor amphitheater. I've seen places like that. But it seems yeah. overgrown. Like it seems unused. Like it's like we've all found it and stumbled <laughs> well, upon it in the woods. And, and what would be a... cool is after we take the picture, the shrubs should be tamed down and it should look more. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so let, let's do some waving. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, like I said so many times on this, seriously, it is such a good thing to see real faces behind all these voices and, and names. So thank you everybody. We've been recording the screen. I will share and clip a, a GIF animation out of it. So thank you. And I do apologize. There's only 50 people who gets to the picture every single time. Uh, I know that there's people who feel bad about not joining or maybe they get cut this time. So. But cool. Uh, let's actually jump them back on the on the demos. I think Abby, you are the next one going. Patrick. Uh, so our first demo <laughs> is. Uh... <laughs> we all know who's up. Go ahead, take it away. <laughs> oh, let me uh, let me share my screen. I'm not going to do too many slides. Just a quick introduction. What I'm going to show you is running the CLI in Azure Container Instances. So for those of you who don't know the CLI yet, the CLI is a cross-platform way of managing Microsoft 365 in a unified way from any platform or tool chain, and it will allow you to manage both your tenant as well as Shepard Framework projects. So we believe it's easy to use. Uh, definitely check out for yourself if you don't believe me. It works on any OS, so whether it's Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, it works in any shell, PowerShell, Bash, Commander, or whatever shell of your liking, and there is one unified login. So you just log in once, and from that point in time, you can talk to all the services in Microsoft 365 that we provide commands for. Now, we do have a fancy Docker container running uh, that you can pull. So you can pull that either locally or as I'm going to show you today, you can actually pull it into Azure Container Instances and use things like managed identity to do long running operations in the cloud against your tenant and use logic apps to orchestrate those, uh, those containers. Now, just some of the building blocks that I'm going to show you. We will uh, use the CLI Docker container, so we're not going to 
uh, into, details, into details about that. So we just assume that it's there. Believe me, it's there. We're going to use it. We're going to have a look at a logic app. That logic app is going to pull in something from a GitHub repo. We're not going to go into too much detail on what's running in GitHub, but we pull in a script. And that script will actually run in the Docker container in our Azure container instances. It will use a managed identity, making sure that we can authenticate against our tenant and that we can use that information to, uh, for instance, get all site collections or get all site collections with a specific state. So that depends on the script that you want to run within the CLI samples. We do have a bunch of sample scripts that you can uh, use or reuse in this way, but basically these are the building blocks. So with that, let's have a look at uh, an actual demo. Let's have a look at actual code. Now, what you see here is you see a resource group within the resource group. I do have a managed identity, so I created a managed identity to make sure that I can do the things that I want to do. The advantage of having a managed identity is that I don't need to log in into my scripts. I can use this managed identity when running scripts. So the Logic App will use this managed identity to attach it to the container that we'll be running. So by doing so, that container automatically uses that identity and can use that identity to get a bunch of scripts. Now, there is one thing that you'll need to do. So what you see here is a new tab where I went to the enterprise applications and I looked up my uh, my enterprise or I looked up my managed identity. And what I need to make sure is that depending on what I want to achieve with my script, I need to make sure that it has the appropriate permissions. So in this case, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do some stuff with all site collections. So I made sure that both from the graph endpoint perspective as well as the SharePoint or Office 365 SharePoint online perspective, I do have the permissions with this managed identity to actually read and write items in all site collections. If I do not have this set of permissions, then I cannot run my script. So this, are, this is the bare minimum to authenticate against your tenant. If you want to do different things, let's say you want to read and write all user profiles, you need that. If you want to do things with Yammer or if you want to do things with the Power Platform, you might require additional permissions and you need to make sure that you add them here. You need to make sure that they have the grant admin consent has been applied. But once you've done that, then your managed identity is ready. You can use that managed identity from there. There's nothing else I need to do. Now, if I go back, what I then have is I have a logic app and the logic app is actually doing all the magic for me. So there's no other code involved and we're just going to walk you through what's in the logic app. So the first step obviously is a trigger. Any logic app or any flow would require a trigger. I did a HTTP trigger. It can be any other trigger. You can run it uh, on a timer, so you can run it every week or every day. That's not really the important part. I also use two, um, two variables, not really important either, um, but because I'm using them multiple times, you'll need them in multiple steps. It's probably easy to create, uh, to create one. The real magic is actually happening in the action called create or updated container group. And this is where the magic is happening. This is where we actually will create a Azure container instance where everything will be run or everything is happening. Now, in order to do that, you'll need your subscription ID, you need a resource group, you'll need a resource group name, which well, I would say probably makes some, makes some sense. That container group name is something that you will use later on. You'll need to set a location. Doesn't really matter where you run it, as long as it's near to wherever your Microsoft 365 tenant is, then you will have the best performance, but it's not a requirement. Then as soon as you have that container group, you can specify the actual container name. So this is what container will be started. And you have to specify a container image. And the advantage of using a container image is that it can actually look at the Docker, uh, the Docker environment or the Docker repository, and it can pull images from there. So by doing this, specifying the M365 PMP slash CLI Microsoft 365 uh, colon latest, you will get the latest. You can also do next, and then you get the beta uh, container with the beta bits, but we're going to go with the latest, just uh, official release that we have. Then 
you have to specify for the container that you will uh, start up how many CPU power, how many memory you will need. And that kind of depends on the size of the scripting that you try to execute. So in my case, I'm just going to pull in some sites. I'm not doing really uh, resource intensive stuff, so this should be enough. If you're running on a, uh, let's say, large tenant with over a million site collections, then you'll probably need some more memory to just process them and work with them. But for demo purposes, this is more than enough. Now, then there is a bunch of stuff that you don't need to specify. You can you can play around with it if you want to, but there's not uh, they're not required. Then. The next step that you will need to specify is that you need to make sure that you actually can run a script. So if you spin up a container, you can pass on command segments. And the requirement of passing on command segments is that it can only be a single command. So you cannot chain commands. You can only execute one single command. Now, in my case, what I actually want to do is I want to uh, do multiple steps into my script. So I want to log in. I want to get all sites. I might want to do get all owners for all sites. So I actually want to do more. In order to do that, what you need to do is you'll need to execute a best script or a PowerShell script for that matter. And you'll need to specify that actual script that needs to come in. So in this case, I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to execute best. This is the script that I want to execute. And then I've got a bunch of other parameters that I can skip not really uh, important, but that script actually needs to come in. I need to get that script. That script is not part of the container image. So if you pull in the container image, that script is not there yet. In order to get a script there, what you'll need to do is you'll need to make sure that you have a reference to that script and that you can say, I'm going to say the container volume, I'm going to mount a container volume. So by um, specifying a repository, giving the name or specifying the name, I can then mount that container image. And that container image is actually coming, if I scroll uh, down a little bit more, is actually coming from a Git repo. So what this does is this will pull in the Git repo. I'll specify the Git repo name called Git repo. And then what you can do is you can say, I'm going to mount Git repo on this path, meaning that on this path, all the scripts will reside that are coming from my Git repo. Now, this Git repo, I can open it. it it's, uh, it's a public repo. So for production purposes, this is not a best practice. You'll probably want to use a private repository because potentially someone can change that script. Would work the exact same way. The only thing that you then need to do is you need to authenticate your Logic App or your Azure subscription to be allowed to uh, access your private repository. In this case, I just put in a test script where in that test script, I do a login action and I'm going to list all site collections. Now, if you remember that login action that I just talked about, the managed identity, I said there's no need for me to log in. There's nothing I need to do. There's only one step within the CLI. I'll need to say this is the ID of the managed identity. And within that container in image, I need to say use that ID of the managed identity. And if that ID matches the managed identity of the container that got spun up, then everything uh, works flawlessly. Then it can sign in and then it actually works. So that's the only requirement that within the script, you'll need a reference to this managed identity or the managed identity that you want to use. Now, going back, then the other thing that you'll need to do is you'll need to actually specify that the container group is using that managed identity. And that's something that you do by setting the managed identity type. I chose the user assigned. You can also use the system assigned. And then you can say this is the actual user that you want to use. And what you will see here is slightly confusing because if you look at the docs, it will give you a sample on how things should look. It's, it's it might be small on your screen, but if you would zoom in, you would see that it gives you a format on how things would look. But the actual stuff that you need to put in there is slightly different. So the docs lag a little bit behind on the actual content that you'll need to put in there. So what you see here is I need to specify, OK, I'm using this subscription with this ID. I'm using this resource group, and then I'm using this actual managed identity. That's the only step that you actually need to spin up everything to get everything working. Now, if we 
go down a little bit more. Then you can do a do until just pulling your uh, your container, pulling your image, seeing if it's finished, if it's done. And you have to do that a few times. Usually it takes between 30 and 60 seconds to process everything. And then you have an action called get logs from the container instance that allows you to get the actual content from the script that has been executed in your container instance. And then I'm going to say, OK, I'm going to delete this, uh, this container group. Now I'm going to press run. That's going to take around 60 seconds to process everything. And because we are already running out of time, I'm going to pick one up that's already succeeded just to walk you through. And you will see that all the actions are green. And then in this case, that it took five iterations to check whether the container image was finished. And if I go to then the get logs, what you see here is a bunch of JSON with all my site collections. Uh, here you can see I've got my site design. Uh, I can see some details. The reason that I get JSON is because in the script I defined it to be output JSON. And now I can either define or refine my script by filtering or doing additional steps. Or I can say I want to have that logic in my logic app in place. So we see that this is something that we run as customers where we can explain to sysadmins who might not have that much experience with uh, either PowerShell or CLI commands. We can just set this up, put the script in place and explain if they want to do different things with the output, they can use the logic app to send it as an email or send it as an adaptive card to teams or do things what they, whatever they want to do with, uh, with that. I saw a question about the slides. I think the slides will actually be shared. Um, if not, reach out on Twitter. I can definitely share them. Some important links in there. If you want to read more on the CLI, then there is the aka.ms link. If you want to see what's happening on the project, you can find everything in GitHub. The Docker image is on Docker Hub. And I did a write up, uh, a walkthrough of all the steps that I took to get this to work. So if you want to uh, well, replay or actually get screenshots how to do this, definitely check out the, uh, the walkthrough. And that's it for today. Awesome stuff. Very, very cool capability there and showing off how to integrate all those different pieces. So really exciting stuff. Uh, thank you for sharing that with us. And next up is Mike Homal. Uh, hopefully I've said Hummel. that not too terribly. <laughs> Hummel. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> cool, Nobody cool, cool. Well, hey. Uh, so yeah, go ahead. I've, yeah, I'm, I'm number one terrible at names. So please take over <laughs> the presentation and uh, let's hear about advanced page properties web part solution. Sounds good. Hey guys. Uh, yeah, I'm Mike. Uh, I'm going to be showing you guys my advanced page properties web part. This is my obligatory credit slide. Um, but the bottom line is uh, I like building things and solving problems. Uh, definitely hit me up on Git or Twitter. Um, one of the ways that I solve client problems at 3Will is we do a lot of this digital workplace consulting. And a lot of times that'll start with workshops and oftentimes will end in like full-blown automation, site template provisioning. And I bring that up because it's a good segue into why I built this web part. In the course of these digital workplace journeys, we inevitably end up with a set of pages that have both rich content and rich metadata. Um, some of that metadata is going to get used for news and highlighted content rollups, uh, or it's just useful for search. And some of it is still going to make sense for display on a page. And that's where you know we might typically use the normal page properties web part. But we've run into a lot of instances where we want to do more and it can display a fair amount of that metadata, but it has some lackings when it comes to different types of data and, and you start to run into things when you realize you want to stretch it a little bit further. SharePoint lists, you know, have continued to mature. You know, we've got, you know, for instance, the, the capsule display, you know, over time things have, have just continued to modernize in the lists, but the page properties web part has not so much uh, improved over time. It's still got a little bit of that older look. Um, it doesn't react to the theming, uh, especially backgrounds. That's always a big one. Uh, it doesn't support links, currency, images, uh, and then it has kind of this default behavior for dates and numbers. Not It doesn't necessarily abide by the actual sub properties that you configure it for. So, 
you know, like I said, like solving problems, like building things. So my way to contribute was to try to take something that might normally look like this and actually address those uh, those issues that I mentioned so that I can have something that looks a little more like that. So let's go ahead and look at it in action. So I've got this employee spotlight page and this is actually a fairly common you know page template that uh, that we combine with that metadata uh, for a lot of customers so this is a fairly common uh, example that we might run into so i've dropped my web part onto the page go ahead and name it so you'll notice uh, that out of the gate it it tries very hard to look almost identical to the original part. Definitely wanted it to feel familiar. Uh, maybe slightly different icons, but otherwise everything's just about the same. The big difference is just that I'm getting more uh, properties available to me. Uh, you know, it still does the same old ones like text and, um, you know, like a uh, term set. Uh, that's the usual, but you can see I'm trying to actually style it a little more the way uh, lists have modernized their displays for multi choice or term sets. But let's go ahead and uh, try something different like a link. So that's something we couldn't have done previously. Another one would have been, uh, let's say, currency couldn't have done that before. Let's see what else we got. Image is a big one. Let's see what happens there. And let's go ahead and add a date, like an anniversary date. And uh, the big difference there is that it's it is actually abiding by the format that you've even specified in the field as well. So that's kind of the part in action. Uh, you know, the normal stuff is also there. You know, I can I can uh, I can delete. I can change just the standard, you know, functionality that we've had in the past as well. Just does more, right? Okay. So I can go ahead and save that and things are looking good. So let's go ahead and look at the code. So um, there's two main concepts. Well, there's, there's a number of main comments, but the big thing here is trying to track the available properties for those drop downs and then needing to track each thing that you select or that our users are going to select and you can see that represented in the uh, web part properties uh, and our selected properties array and this is just tracking the internal names of the fields that they're going to select and then uh, our available properties uh, is tracking uh, using the drop down option, and that's just the uh, name value pair. Right below that, you can see that I'm starting to scaffold the code necessary for tracking the theme when the theme changes and uh, the actual variant that needs to get passed down to the component. Big shout out to Hugo. Uh, I essentially followed his blog post on this to the T to get this working. And uh, in my blog post on this, I've referenced his as well. So, um, and you can see, you know, we're, from the component perspective, uh, the web part is taking the selected properties uh, that the user is selected and our theme variant and passing that down as, a, as uh, properties for the component. One of the core functions of the web part uh, on the web part side is needing to actually establish what those available properties can be. You can see we're using the PMPJS library to establish uh, the fields for site pages. Um, there's a bit of strange alchemy uh, just below here where I had to kind of by trial and error uh, start to figure out what properties Microsoft was using to determine what goes into that dropdown. And that's kind of these, uh, the stuff that you see up here in the top part of the condition. And then down here are some uh, different types that I've had to exclude for now, uh, just because I hadn't figured out the right way to display it yet. Uh, so there are, you can already see that there's room for improvement uh, in other ways to contribute. The only other thing to point out about the web part 
is uh, the way that we have to render out the property pane because that's really the big deal uh, with the web part. Uh, and everything's governed by what's in the selected properties array. So as they add, as they delete, we're affecting change on the selected properties array. So you can see that I've got an event handler for when they click delete, when they click add, we're either pushing, uh, pulling, or, or changing uh, an actual value. And that's all against our selected properties. If I go down just a little bit more to where we render out the, uh, the property pane, you can see again, the selected properties array is being employed where we're looping through that. And that's where we're actually pulling in a dropdown uh, of the available properties and that delete button and that add button. So let's jump over to the component itself that the web part's loading up. It doesn't have to do that much. It's just all in the logic, right? Uh, you can see we're using React hooks. And the main thing we need uh, to track state on is this value page prop values. I'll take a quick detour just to show you that object type, just because it's worth pointing out, because this is really at the heart of it, right? I at, at runtime, I need to know as much metadata about the field itself. Uh, and then I need to be able to capture any and all possible values for that field for the page. So we need to cast the widest net possible. And so it's in any array. Oh, and I guess I'll point out too, this is just the standard PMP object for the field information. But that gets us everything that we need. Uh, just below that, you can see where I'm setting the theme variant. Again, uh, uh, making use of that all in the display uh, at runtime. So refresh properties, this is kind of the lifeblood uh, function of the component. Again, I, like I mentioned, we've got two main uh, things we're trying to get down to, and that's uh, we need to know all of the actual values for that specific page in the list. So that's the first thing that we're going to go ahead and grab. We know the selected properties, so we're going to go ahead and make a call using PMP to actually get that list item out and all of the values, regardless of what they are. And then we also need to establish all the metadata for each field so that we can figure out how we're gonna, you know, what rules we're gonna employ, right? Like I mentioned before, I need to ensure that I'm casting the widest net. So I've gotta make sure that I can convert anything to that any array. So that's kind of, you know, what's going on here. Uh, some of the fields based on their type, they come down, you know, you don't know exactly which way they're gonna come down. They could have different properties. They're, they're completely different objects. You got to be prepared for that. So, and that includes uh, having to convert it to an any array can be a little bit different depending on the type. Again, use effect, uh, whenever the property gets changed in the property pane, we're pushing that down to the component and that's going to trigger another refresh of the, uh, of the display. Um, the, the rendering is a little bit nested, you know, as we go down, you know, we're, we're looping through all of the properties right here, and then we're actually displaying all the actual property values based on the property. So that gets us to the main method, which is our render page prop values for display. And again, it's very reactive. The, the whole idea is to just in, essentially interrogate the type of field it is and use that type to help us determine the ways that we're going to actually display that data. And that includes, that could include making entirely different elements on the page or just having different styles. Um, you can even see as we get into something like a date time display, we might interrogate some of those sub properties uh, that you save it as in the list that's gonna help us know which way to format the date um, according to, and I, and I basically, I. I used the way it gets displayed in the list as my baseline for how I was going to display it in the uh, in the web part. And that's essentially it. The only other thing, again, I'll just point out, you may have already noticed it throughout, uh, you know, up here in some of the rendering is, is um, again, we're just interrogating our theme variant uh, to decide, um, you know, based on uh, what's going on uh behind the scenes which background we should be using um and that's the same here in our main render method
So that's basically the part. Uh, I did want to point out that I've already had a number of other ideas, uh, and I wanted to make sure I just threw up this slide for other folks, because I would love to get more contributors, and I'd love to continue to grow this part. Like I said, we do use the normal you know, page properties part on a number of pages still for customers, and they always want to be able to click the capsules. Uh, they kind of, they, they feel like they should be kind of almost like tags. Um, so I'd love to come up with, uh, with a solution to actually allow those to actually be clickable and do something with it. Uh, people field is the only one that I don't support that the original does. So I'd definitely like to get that. And I'd love to get any other ideas, uh, from the community. Uh, so please, um, if you feel inclined, go out to the, uh, get repo, uh, PMP samples and, uh, if you put in an issue and that mentioned me, I'd, I'd be happy to help or uh, contribute with you. Thank you again for your time. Uh, like I said, you can read up on this part on the tech community blog and you can access the code in the PMP samples repo and uh, please contribute. Thank you guys. Really fantastic stuff, Mike. Thank you for sharing that. And uh, if folks are interested, you know, he's asking for contribution help. So that'd be a great way uh, if you're looking for a place to contribute and get involved. Uh, this seems like a really uh, fantastic opportunity. And our next presenter is somebody uh, who needs no introduction. Thank you. So that was, that was fast. So um, I'm going to talk about the SharePoint Framework 1.12.1. Uh, I'll do two quick demos uh, related on that one. Obviously, we are on the end of the community call and we're always running out of time, but we'll certainly have more demos as we GA 1.12.1, um, but I'll show some uh, information on it, which probably haven't seen yet. So first of all, I, I do want to always show the overall bigger picture. Uh, so SharePoint Framework is really intended to, right now. Uh, it's, it's extending, so it's intended to be ex ex uh, the extensibility platform for Microsoft Viva, Microsoft Teams, and SharePoint. And of course, it's most likely being used in a SharePoint, but it's actually highly convenient for Microsoft Teams as well, and, and Viva as we're surfacing SharePoint inside of the, the Microsoft Teams. Um, the, really, the, the power is, is the fact that you don't need to set up the Azure applications. Everything is auto-hosted and optimized for hosting, especially if you only have a UX uh, capabilities or you're hitting graph APIs. So it's a really convenient scenario. Right now, we are hitting tens of millions of monthly active users uh, who are using SharePoint Framework, third-party SharePoint Framework components in Microsoft Teams and SharePoint. So it's a really, really widely uh, adapted and being used. And tens of millions of third-party components means components being built by customers or partners. Uh, so not first-party components, which are provided by Microsoft. And why are we keep on pushing on this one? Uh, because, well, we're clearly seeing with the success, uh, we're also seeing that there's a huge opportunity for using SharePoint Framework inside of the Microsoft Teams. So as part of the 1.12.1, uh, Teams is a, one of the key focus areas as well. I will show one simple pack packaging demo around that one uh, as within the following slides as well. But really the, the power of SPFX within the Teams is that you don't need to set up that Azure application. You don't need to worry about app, uh, app registrations, permissions, scopes, any of that one. Everything is basically automatically taken care of. So you can just synchronize your solution to Microsoft uh, Teams app catalog and voila, it works because it's all the hosted that by SharePoint. And this is a model which we used also quite heavily and uh, with inside of Microsoft. So SharePoint being kind of a transforming to the, not only the backend on the, for Microsoft Teams, but also the content and backend for Microsoft Teams. So kind of a hosting mechanisms in this case. So really, really cool stuff. And there's a lot of new scenarios which are coming related on, on Viva Connections. So whatever has been released right now with Viva Connections, just that. Uh, just a scratch uh, on on uh, on all of the things which are in the pipeline. So I can't share too much on that one, but within a few weeks, there's Microsoft Build, uh, and Jeff Deeper is going to show some of those stuff which are in the plan. Now on the 1.12.1 uh, release details, uh, so we are updating the Note uh, version to 14, which is super important. So we are. Finally, catching up on the latest LTS version of Note, uh, we'll have more access on the base structure and context to avoid DOM dependence. I'll show this one in practice. It's not a mind-blowing thing, but you'll get access on something which out-of-the-box web parts are using to understand are they being rendered as a full wide or in a section or in smallest uh, pieces, which is important for web parts for sure. The support for the complex Microsoft Teams solution, I'm going to show a demo, a quick demo on that one as well. So how does it actually work in practice? But this is really for the fact that 
if you, as an example, want to build a Microsoft Teams meeting application, which is now possible with 112.1 with SharePoint Framework, you will need to set additional settings in the Microsoft Teams manifest so that the Microsoft Teams will understand that, oh, this component is intended to be used as a Microsoft Teams meeting application. And in those scenarios, you'll simply embed the zip file or the manifest file or the Microsoft Teams uh, solution structure or the Microsoft Teams solution manifest file inside of the SPP KJ file. And I'll show that one in practice, how it's actually being created and, and packaged and how, how SharePoint handles that as we're synchronizing things. So technical nuances. Uh, initial support from the Teams meeting application. There's unfortunately small delays on the Microsoft Teams side on the on getting some of the server size changes out. So we're still bending on some, some areas on there. Uh, there was a good demo on that one, however, two weeks ago, uh, and the recording is already available by Nandeep, uh, who showed how to do SharePoint framework driven Microsoft Teams application. So we, I'm not going to show that today. Uh, right now, we're going to support Microsoft Teams SDK 1.8. 1.9 is in the roadmap, so it's going to be supported in 1.13 of SharePoint framework, but not yet. Uh, again, technical dependencies here and there, which are delaying things. Uh, something which is new on this list is also the list and library subscription uh, general availability. So previously, our you were able to associate your web part to be, uh, let's say, sub subscribed to events from document libraries in SharePoint sites. But now you can actually do that for lists as well. So you're basically able to say whenever a new item is uh, added on the list or a library or whenever there's a property change or an item modification in a list, your web part will get notified. So you're basically then able to refresh the web part UX uh, automatically when there's new items being added on the list. So as an example, just a random scenario, you have like something like Power Automate uh, pumping in your business data from uh, Azure or in a safe way uh, to a list, just the relevant data, just, just that data which you want to expose. And then you have a uh, SharePoint Framework web part which is exposing some business uh, related data. So really cool scenario as well. Uh, and then there's a lot of uh, small uh, improvements, uh, whatever was reported in 112 for this are going to be fixed. And then as an example, in the, the new Yeoman generator, we're going to show the version number of the SPFX, which are running as a simple thing. But as an example, Chris Kent has been requesting that feature for a long, long, long time. So that's now actually there. So that's Chris, at least is for you. All right. Ooh. Now let's actually do a few demos on this. Uh, like I said, we don't have a massive amount of time, but I'll, sh I'll show the, the two scenarios uh, in a more detailed way. So more access on the base structure and context to avoid DOM dependency. Now, not a rocket science thing, uh, but what it actually means uh, is that let me actually add here a really simple web part, just focusing on the scenario and, and technical thing, what we're doing here. And the web part name is something like white tester. There we go. Uh, and basic idea is here is that your web part will know what is the wide where it's being rendered. So we'll expose the new uh, property for in the web part base class, which will actually expose the wide of the web part spacing. And what it means is that whenever I'm changing, for example, let's actually do that. Whenever I'm changing the section to be smaller, uh, the wide um, uh, is being adjusted and, and the web part will know and will be notified that, hey, now you're being rendered in a smaller space. If you have a different rendering output, when you are in less than 400 pixels, uh, you can take advantage of that. Previously, this kind of a functionality required that you are detecting the DOM structure and then analyzing am I in a what kind of a section, how many columns there is in the section, and then you adjust your rendering. So as an example, the out of the box hero web part and the newest web parts are using this to change their rendering logics, logistics uh, from being multiple, uh, well, I think the smallest one is that every single image is being rendered one by one and then being transferred one step at a time. So it, it's a good example of an out-of-the-box web part, which is actually taking advantage of this. And how this actually works, uh, again, simple thing, but I think it's a good add-on. Um, and it's just fair that you will get access on the same things as what out-of-the-box web parts have. And this is really nothing more than, uh, let me actually get rid of that. Uh, there is a new white property, uh, which is in the base class of the of the web part, which will give you uh, the white in pixels. 
and then you are basically able also to subscribe on an after after resize event and this is basically for catching the resizing happening on a page so that you're able to re-render uh, whatever you're rendering uh, and changing the rendering logic in this case this is a super super simple example just focusing on the change in here but good to see Charles Rodriguez is, is already super excited on the on this one but absolutely a useful thing um, and like I said out of the box web parts has been taking advantage of this one as well so it's good to be available for you as well now the second thing uh, is that we're going to change slightly uh, the packaging uh, structure and packaging model uh, within the SharePoint framework solution this is not going to break obviously anything which is already there but this is an additional option and what we're going to do is that by default, SharePoint Framework, when you sync your solution to the Teams, by default, what happens is that SharePoint Framework basically reads uh, the configure package solution information. It's going to use uh, this information, for example, in the developer section for the name and website URL, privacy URL, in terms of use and NPM ID and a few additional settings. But if we have a look on a really complex manifest, or this is not super complex manifest, but a, a manifest uh, can be super complex. It can have a dependency on bot. It can define a task module. It can define multiple other things. There are additional settings and options all the time being introduced as part of this uh, manifest. So rather than us in SharePoint engineering, trying to keep up with all of the latest things, for example, what's supported in manifest version 1.9, we kind of start supporting embedding the whole zip file as part of the solution. And this will work in a way that uh, in the Teams folder, uh, you will need to have a specifically named the zip file and slightly awkward, but again, it makes sense because in general code in server side is then just detecting that zip file inside of the SVPKJ file. So what I have here is that I, I'm actually gonna show this one in practice. Let's open it in here. Uh, so this is manually created zip file, which have been created by adding my, my image, my uh, manifest, which I created manually, and the two of the images, and then basically just created a zip file in here. Of course, you can use uh, App Studio in, in Teams or whatever tooling you prefer to create the manifest file and then export that from there. But then I need to have the zip file uh, named as Teams SPFX app.zip. And that's basically then a detection for SharePoint that, oh, this is that kind of a zip file which is intended to be the one which was synchronizing the teams. So, um, so when we are then packaging the solution, let me actually do that quickly. Uh, so here, uh, when we do call up uh, package uh, solution, I think I actually have a one version package already, but that's fine. Uh, SharePoint engine and the packaging tooling will actually detect that, uh, that zip file, and it will actually contain or add that one included in the package. So you can, we can see that if we extend the SharePoint folder in here and the debug folder, which actually contains what's inside of this SPPKG file, in the client-side assets, we have the Teams SPFX app zip file available. And then this means that whenever I'm actually installing the package manifest solution inside of the app catalog and synchronize, we actually take that manifest, which is included in the SPPKG file, and then we use that one. Uh, where's my browser? There we go. We use that one then to actually uh, uh, synchronize or add and install that to the Teams uh, app catalog. So, in, like in this case, I've just created an example, which is just using the I synchronized this while back uh, or for testing, but I'm able to modify all of this stuff directly in the JSON file or creating the whole manifest in the manifest uh, in the App Studio and then synchronize that in. So. And that gives the flexibility. It can have a dependency of whatever. It can have an association to bot. It can do additional other settings, whatever the manifest uh, is supporting. We support that as part of the SPFX solutions as well, and also including store deployments. So if you're looking into getting a solution to the store, that works as well. But now uh, we're running out of time. Uh, so that's a really quick demo on two of those things. I just want to make sure that everybody understands what they are because we talked about it. Uh, the meeting application uh, was really, there was a great demo from Nandip Nahan two weeks ago. Uh, the video of this one, individual video, will go out in a few days. Um, but you can already find the recording from two weeks ago uh, for, where Nandip did a great job of showing how to build Microsoft Teams meeting application with SharePoint Framework. The recording of this uh, uh, this particular call will be out within the 
uh, Microsoft 365 community YouTube channel within 24 hours. And please follow up on us on Twitter. Next SPFX call, SharePoint framework call will be on May 6th. It's already May, it's pretty wild. And the next Microsoft 365 channel development call is a week from now at the same time, where we focus on, on a bit different areas, but obviously everything is overlapping in the large Microsoft 365 platform. And if you're looking into all of the community calls, AKMS M365 BNP is the address where you can access them, download the invites, there's a lot of them, choose, choose the ones which you wanna actually use and check those which you wanna use uh, view as a recording. But thank you, uh, Mike. And, and Abby for great demos today. I do apologize. I, I went slightly long on my explanation uh, on this latest on SPFX, but thank you everybody for joining. Thank you for your feedback. Please keep the feedback coming. We are building all of our this capability for you as our customers and partners. So please, please, please remember to let us know what works and what doesn't, but that's it for now. Thanks everybody. Stay healthy and we'll be in touch. Mm -hmm.